Welcome to Malpractice Podcast. Hi, are you ready to get started? Oh, you're saying hi now. Are you permanently in the camp of hi? Do we like the hi? I like the hi. <laughs> no, I don't care. This is Mail Practice Podcast in the morning. Hi, I'm Jess. <laughs> oh, I'm Sydney. And we're in the morning and we're tired. <laughs> Let's just do that whole part over again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm Jess. I'm Sydney. And this is Malpractice in the Morning. Yeah, this is us. This is us and you're listening to us work out our shit on air (laughs) so welcome and we know some of you don't like that and which is offensive you're just gonna want to go ahead and skip the next like seven minutes yeah and then move on with your life that's fine i'm okay with it or you could just move on with your life and enjoy the next seven minutes (laughs) right we're gonna have a good time i mean so right before we started the zoom call i was eating a biscuit that was covered in strawberry rhubarb jelly Ooh. Because one of our friends gave us, this is so thoughtful because I fucking love jelly and jams and honeys. So he gave us like an advent calendar that has a different jelly or honey for each day. Oh, that's good. Isn't that so sweet? Yeah. So thanks, Manu. I'm daily enjoying a biscuit with jelly on it in your name. Are they are they good sizes or are they little sample they're sizes? They're little, they're like this big. Oh. Like enough to they're put cute. on like probably four biscuits. No. Not with the way you just sized it. <laughs> Not with my biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's an important question. Do you put how much jelly do you put on a biscuit? A lot. I love all of that. I like anything sweet. Yeah, I love an advent calendar. I do too. Wait, did I send you? I sent you that <laughs> my favorite TikTok of that little girl Mm-mm. who woke up or the woman who was Oh, you did. Yeah. And she's like uh, she opened this, all her advent yeah. calendar days and ate all the chocolate. And it's yeah. like two in the morning and this this woman is like pretending to be her child, right? And she like gets slapped in the face by her child and yeah. she's like, is it Christmas yet? And her mom's like, what? what is going on? What is this? And it's like chocolate on her face. The kid leaves chocolate on her <laughs> yeah. face and she touches her cheek like, what is this? <laughs> and there's chocolate all over the kid's mouth and, and the she's using like little hands. <laughs> and she's like, did you open your calendar? And she's like, no. And then it pans to like the calendar all being yeah. open. And she's like, did you eat all the chocolate? And the little girl's like, yes. <laughs> like very yes. psychotic. Like with her little hands. And yeah. then she's like, is it Christmas yet? <laughs> Dude. I'm literally still laughing. Kids love Christmas. Like kids love Dude, the holidays same. period. They're so excited. I'm excited. I yeah. We okay, I will say Eric has done a very, very good job of getting our yard Christmas out. Eric likes Christmas. He loves I'll have to send you a picture of our yard. It literally is so Christmassy that while he was putting up the final touches, a stranger drove by, stopped their car, and was like, Wow, you have the best lights in your neighborhood. Oh, okay. Not that there's a competition, but we might enter. <laughs> but just saying we might win. <laughs> um, I think I did I tell you about this last time? The new project that I'm working on right now is a plywood cutout of the Grinch yeah. who's going to be stealing lights off the tree. That's so cool. I haven't done it yet. I'll send you a picture when I finish it, though. Wow. Put that on the list of things that I'll never do. <laughs> yeah. I'm a crafty bitch. You are. I was like, Eric... We need to have a what do they call it? Like a like a blog. Like a blog where you talk about decorating and like home improvement projects. Not me, but you should. Right? And I'm gonna call it craftybitch.com. Crafty bitch. TM. <laughs> <laughs> Don't steal my name. <laughs> Crafty bitch. No, nah, it couldn't be me. I'm not doing that. Yeah, it is me all the time. I'm always working on a craft. I'm literally in the middle right now of three separate Christmas based projects. Mm-mm. Christmas is essentially here, so I'm not. Eric has, and I love this about him, he's very optimistic, and he has this idea in his head that if he sees a project and gets it in his mind, he's like, Sydney can do this. She can make this. And sometimes the answer is, yes, I can. And sometimes the answer is like, I have literally no idea how to make that happen. Yeah. 
I believe me. What's your favorite Christmas movie? The Grinch. I love The Grinch so much. The Jim Carrey Grinch. I don't like the the animated Grinch. It's fine. It's whatever. I understand it. I watched it last year and I'm I'm about it. I get it. But the Jim Carrey Grinch, Chef's Kiss, sheer perfection. What is yours? Love actually. I love that movie. Oh, that's a good one. I watch it all the time. I watch it outside of the Christmas season and I just sob every time. That's like the best movie. Yeah. I just feel like the there's some storylines that I can't deal with. Like the Alan Rickman, the Snape guy, he does his wife dirty. Oh, yeah, but that's a good part. Yeah. And then the other guy who holds up the sign for his best friend's wife. I, I love that. He's like, I've that. always loved you. I'm like, can you imagine? That's Kira Knightley, right? She's gorgeous. Who yeah. I love. Uh, I'm obsessed. Literally have loved her since Bend It Like Beckham. Can you imagine? No. No. Yeah, we watch it, like, multiple times. Yeah. My mom likes the classics, so every time we were with my parents for the holidays, we watch It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, I don't like those. You know, like the old classic movies. Uh, What's the one with the, you'll shoot your eye out? Oh, yeah, uh, A Christmas Ralphie, Story. That's Christmas my dad's story. favorite movie, yep. period. I don't like it. <laughs> really? Yep. You know what I don't like about those old classics is that i hate that time period <laughs> is that like the 50s the christmas story yes yeah because like 50s 60s ugh. <laughs> the dad in that movie trash aggressive like, yeah who yeah very aggressive very uh, um toxic masculinity vibes yeah i don't they put soap in their child's mouth don't oh like that. yeah my grandparents did that to my parents and also used to do it to the grandkids i never got it because I'm a good kid, but I remember, like, hold a bar of soap in your mouth. But what, for what? For what? Because it's like your, your potty mouth, you say, like, a, an ugly word, and you get your mouth washed out with soap. That is disgusting. It also Isn't sounds that, like, like borderline abuse. <laughs> no, not borderline. I'd say creeping into. Creeping on into, into it. Like, you can't do that to your kids today. Don't wash your kid's mouth out with soap. Don't it's, do it. They need therapy now if you do that. Period. Right. I think so. That dad needs some therapy from a Christmas story. I'll tell you that right now. He definitely does. They need like family. Counseling. Yeah. Should we get into it? Are you ready to hear a story? I'm going to tell you a story. Tell me a story. I love a story. So this episode, um, we are going to talk about Florence Nightingale, who's like whoop, whoop. arguably like the founder of like modern nursing and is credited with kind of like paving that way. I'm so excited because I don't know anything about her, but she's like a household name. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she was alive from 1820 to 1910. Mm -hmm. She lived to be like around 90 years old. Oh my God. So shout out to her. Good karma. She's also called the lady with the lamp, which we'll get into why. Mm -hmm. And she was doing all the good work, saving lives and paving the way for nurses of the future. And she's the most recognized figure and name in the field of nursing. Yeah. So even like, as you said, like you don't know much about her specifically, like I didn't when I started researching, mm -hmm. you still know the name. Right. A hundred percent. Which like speaks to kind of her rec being recognized. Mm -hmm. She developed modern nursing and patient care specifically. Um, and then the oath that nurses take is like named after her. And I have Aww. like that at the end. And so I'll like read it. Um, it's gone through some edits over time, but I'll read like the most um, updated one that I could find. I don't know why, but when you said that was named after her, it gave me chills. Like, such a lasting legacy, you know? And it should be. Okay. Florence Nightingale was born May 12th, 1820 in Florence, Italy, which is cute because they named her after the place she was born because she was actually English, um, but born in Italy, and, and her parents named her from where she was born. Yeah. Um, her parents were named Frances Nightingale mm -hmm. and William Shore. Nightingale, and she was the youngest of two children, the second of two daughters. So her family was wealthy, upper class, belonged to like the elite social circles of the time. Her mom mm -hmm. was from a family of merchants, and she loved to socialize. And apparently the apple did fall far from the tree because Florence did not enjoy those settings mm -hmm. and was described like often as being an awkward person. <laughs> she liked to not be the center of attention and their differences of personality caused them to fight a lot. So she and her mom did not, they were not the same at all. Did not get along. Aww. 
Oh, that's such a bummer. Also, her mom's name is Frances, and you're like, she loves to throw a party. And I was like, my mom's name is Frances, and she loves to throw a party. Yeah, it must be a Frances thing. Must be. Her father was a landowner. He inherited two estates. One was at Lee Hurst in Derbyshire. Derbyshire? Mm -hmm. Derbyshire. (laughs) Derbyshire. I don't know. And the other was in Hampshire, Embley Park. He inherited those when she was like five years old or Mm five-ish. Her family split time between the two locations and London was the place that during social season they would go. And those places that she was called awkward, they were like out in season. That's like what it was called. So she's like rich, rich. She's bebopping around to different estates. She's got like money, money. Okay. Yeah. She got a classical education at the estate uh, in Le Hurst, mm-hmm. and she studied German, French, and Italian. Must be nice. <laughs> yeah. Her father took a real specific interest in her education, and she did really well in math and, like, all language in general. Yeah. So um, she was kind of, like, supposedly, like, his focal point. Like, she was super smart, and so he was like, oh, let me kind of pour into you. Okay, cool. From the start, she was super interested in in philanthropy. So her family was Unitarian, Mm. and her religious beliefs really really steered her. So she has... I don't... hmm? What are the Unitarians? What do they do? So I went to a Unitarian church in Houston one time, and it's just like care for each other, service-based kind of community. Okay. But they're Christian? Yeah, it's Christian. Okay. Okay. Yeah. With an emphasis on kind of community. Yeah, and service and like cool. helping. And there was so many times where she was like participating in a church event and she would feel called into like a, the service work. Mm-hmm. And she took up ministering to the poor and ill people in the village near her family's estate. By the age of 16, it was clear that nursing was her calling. Mm hmm. She actually said it was like her divine purpose and that feeling of being her divine purpose was not extended to her family because her family was super mad that she would dare to like lower herself because oh. nursing was not a respected field. It was like a lower class, like you okay. needed a job. Yeah. They told her no. Okay. You cannot pursue your career during that time, a woman of her social status was expected to marry a wealthy man and not get a job mm. because you're supposed to raise a family. Like, what are you doing? Right. Like, that's your job as a woman. Yeah. Also, if my super rich family was like, I just need you to stay here and vibe. I'd be vibing. <laughs> Got a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like in the corner. Perfect. What do I need to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she that's not that's not flow. I'd be like, Jeeves, prepare my carriage. I'm going to London for the social season. <laughs> Flo was like, nah, I'm gonna I'm going to turn down marriage proposals, actually. So she was 17, and she turned down. Get it, girl. Um, She turned down a marriage proposal from a man named Richard Monkton. Monkton? Monkton. Monkton. Mon- I don't <laughs> Whatever. Richard M. Milnes. <laughs> Whatever. Which is probably why, because that's a trash name. Um, She said, like, he stimulated her intellectually and romantically, but he didn't satisfy her, like, moral active nature. So she was she like. She said that when she was 17? Yes. She's a genius. Her desire to reach out and to help and to make change happen for others, he just, like, wasn't on par. So she declined. God damn. Imagine the mentality at 17 to be like, you're not satisfying my morally active nature, so you got to go. When I was 17, I'd be like, a boy liked me? (laughs) (laughs) Literally. Yeah. She's a genius to hold up that belief from the time you're 17 and be like, no, I actually, this is my principle and I'm standing behind it. Like, what a boss. So she like turned him down and she ended up enrolling as like a nursing student at the Institution of Mm -hmm. Protestant Deaconesses at Kaiserwerth in Germany for two weeks of training. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Cool. Jesus. In July of 1850. And again, like three months for three months in July of 1851. And she Mm -hmm. learned like basic nursing skills. I guess like it's heavy. You're not just like going to one class and going home. You're like in the trenches learning like all the time. Okay. And she learned basic nursing skills, the importance of patient observation and the value of good hospital organization. And then 
In the 1850s, she returned to London and took a job at the Institution for Sick mm-hmm. Gentlewomen, which were governesses, which were like nannies of the time. Okay. In um in distressed circumstances in London, which is like a really interesting name. So it's literally called the Institution for Sick Gentlewomen in Distressed Circumstances. My God, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Do you have an acronym for that? <laughs> it's actually super descriptive. Yeah, it tells you exactly what they're no. doing there. You have to be a gentlewoman, you... you have to be sick, and you must be under distressed circumstances. <laughs> and then you could come here. <laughs> it's also like the most English thing I've ever heard to call it like distressed circumstances. Yes. She was great at her job, and she got promoted really quickly. Mm. She was made the superintendent, mm. and that was at like a really challenging time because there was a cholera outbreak um, that happened. Yeah. It's just, like, not the most sanitary of times, right? So Mm -hmm. um, disease and germs were spreading. She was, like, taken aback by that at first. And then she just kind of, like, made it her mission to, like, take on hygiene practices as well as, like, an opportunity to share with the public, like, you should be clean. Yeah. This is also, I just want to point out, number one, we should do a separate episode on cholera because that shit is wild. Yeah. Yeah. And this is also like 10 years before germ theory was discovered. So they weren't doing things like washing their hands. Mm -hmm. Uh, My understanding is that at this time, it wasn't like widespread knowledge that like germs were the problem and germs cause infection. No, yeah. So they didn't know about like bacteria and things like that. So they're not washing their hands. Those sanitary conditions, I'm guessing, are wild. Yeah. 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 So she like noticed that and it actually becomes like part of her like uh, um and we'll get into this but she becomes like extremely ill and like bedridden for the last section of her life mm. but she still was writing yeah books on like hygiene and nursing wow. and like best practices so we'll we'll kind of talk about literally what I just said but um she's like one of the first to be like wait yeah. um this is disgusting this is probably why you're sick. She's so ahead of her time. Oh yeah, she's a bop. <laughs> so in n- 1853, the Crimean, I believe I'm saying that right, Mm -hmm. war started in which the British went to war against the Russian Empire to control the Ottoman Empire. Okay. So the Turkish Ottoman Empire declared war on Russia following a series of disputes over holy places like Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And the Russians demanded to exercise protection over the Orthodox subjects in Ottoman, uh, like of the Ottoman Sultan. So they're just like a lot of like men making poor decisions probably at the time. And the British and the French... (laughs) Allies of Turkey sought to push Russia back, basically. Okay. So, all that to say, British soldiers headed off to war pretty much at the same time that Flo, that's what I call Florence, um, has, like, reached her kind of, like, peak superiority Mm -hmm. in, like, nursing. Also, did you just give me a brief history lesson on the Crimean War? That was quick. You know. Yeah. Um, Quick. Love it. Short and sweet. So, the soldiers head off to war. Supplies went way down, and they were sent in droves to hospitals. There were no female nurses in the hospitals in the war because apparently there were, like, past female nurses that had a bad reputation, whatever. I mean... After a battle called the Battle of Alma, England as a whole was, like, really upset about the neglect of their ill and injured war heroes. Mm -hmm. So they're finding out, like, information about how the, the soldiers that they're sending are not being taken care of okay they lacked medical attention because the hospitals were severely understaffed and unsanitary even sometimes they were described as like inhumane Ooh. um right so in 1854 flo got a letter from the secretary of war sydney herbert Mm -hmm. who asked her to organize a group of nurses to help the sick and fallen soldiers in the war Hmm. and she did she got between 34 and 38, different sources said different specific numbers, mm-hmm. nurses from different religious organizations, and she traveled with them overseas. Where the battle was happening? Wow. Yes. That's crazy. Also, she's getting, like, national recognition from, like, war, heads of war councils <laughs> and stuff. I'm sorry. like Secretary of War. <laughs> and she has to be what? How old is she at this point? Uh, so she was, like, 17 when she went to school. Mm -hmm. She's got to be, like... 20s? 20. (laughs) Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So her and her nurse team go over. They're excited to make a difference. But it was, like, disgusting and crazy when they got there. Yeah. They'd been warned that the situation was terrible. Like, no one was saying it was good. But even the descriptions they were receiving were not enough to prepare her and the nurses for what they saw. Yeah. The hospital was the... 
Scrutari British Base Hospital. That's where they ended up going. Mm -hmm. And it was sitting like on a cesspool, which contaminated water and the building itself. So it was patients were lying around in their own feces on stretchers (gasps) that were on the floor Uh, uh. in like no organized fashion. There were rodents everywhere and bugs infested. Mm -mm. They had no supplies, limited soap, limited bandages. And those... um, went down right as the injured soldiers went up so they already were limited and and all of that would go down the more people were injured and the longer soldiers stayed the sicker they got water even had to be like rationed at the time yeah during her first winter there, 4,077 soldiers died. Uh, uh. Um, and soldiers were dying of typhoid cholera and dysentery like that was the common So there were more soldiers dying in the hospitals than there were dying in the war itself because of the conditions of the hospitals. Oh, that's so bad. Typhoid, cholera, dysentery are all typically spread by like having like dirty conditions. Typhoid, we should do a separate episode too on Typhoid Mary, but the spreading of typhoid is literally like you got typically like infected feces on your hands that's disgusting and then touch someone or someone's food the spread of typhoid is like real gross it's not good so yeah i mean that's enough for me i don't need to hear any more about it this description (laughs) makes me personally if i put myself in that situation i'd be like i would walk in and have a panic attack (laughs) i'd be like i'm out you would expect that but she like walked in and was like all right I'm taking this on. Damn. She got scrub brushes and asked least ill patients to help clean. Wow. They literally scrubbed the hospital from floor to ceiling. Then she went to work taking care of the soldiers. She got funds from the London Times to, like, buy supplies. Wow. During the nighttime, she would continue working. She literally worked, like, all the time. Yeah. And she went by lamplight. So she moved around the halls carrying a lamp in hand, comforting people, checking on soldiers. Mm. And the soldiers loved it and her and her endless compassion. They actually named her the lady with the lamp or the angel of Crimea. So, like, that's where that name comes from. Mm. So I wanted to read a couple things. So she, they, like, wrote songs and poems about her. Oh, that gave me chills. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to read some. This is from... The life of Florence Nightingale. She is a ministering angel without any exaggeration in these hospitals. And as her slender form glides quietly along each corridor, every poor fellow's face softens with gratitude at the sight of her. When all the medical officers have retired for the night and the silence and the darkness have settled down upon those miles of sick, she may be observed alone with a little lamp in her hand making her solitary rounds. Oh my God. So isn't that cool? Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. So the phrase lady with the lamp, right, was further popularized by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem. And in the poem, he says, Lo, in that house mm-hmm. of misery, a lady with a lamp I see, pass through the glimmering gloom and flit from room to room. But isn't that so cool? They wrote about her. It's so cool. Yeah. Can you imagine also being... In this, like, second wave of people who are in this hospital as she's there, when you know that everybody in the first round was, like, mega hosed, you're like, she's going to save me. Like, she's going to be the reason that I live. Yeah. It's so cool. Like, so much gratitude, right? Yes. And so she improved the sanitary conditions, obviously. Mm -hmm. But she also... So the improvement of the sanitary conditions reduced the death rates by two thirds while she was there. Oh my god! And that will eventually come up because she works with like status static. How do you say that? Status statisticians. Statist- You're gonna see her like be a mathematician in a minute too. Mm. So she developed patient services and improved the quality of the hospital. Period. Mm-hmm. Um, and she developed other things, too. So there was a kitchen where the dietary needs were addressed for patients. She, like, set up all of these other additional things in the hospital. She created a laundry so patients could, you know, have clean shit. Um, she got, like, soldier wives to help with the laundry. Mm-hmm. So she, like, went out and got volunteers to come and wash sheets. That's amazing. So that they could have clean linens. Yeah. She instituted a classroom and a library for intellectual stimulation and entertainment for the, the sick soldiers. Wow. She then wrote notes on matters affecting the health efficiency and hospital administration of the British Army, which was an 830-page report. 
analyzing her own experiences and recommending changes for other military hospitals under poor conditions. This woman. I know. So in her in her yeah. spare time, she started a kitchen, a laundry, and a, a school, wrote an 830-page book, and was still flitting from room to room. She literally is like, I'm going to tackle all of your needs. Let's talk about your diet. Let's talk about your laundry. Let's talk about your education. Yeah. yeah. And then she also is like, and everybody else needs to be doing the same thing. Y'all wrong for that. Yeah. <laughs> and like, let me help you. I'm so impressed. I know. Her book started a huge restructuring in the administrative department of the war office. And even the um, the establishment of a royal commission for the health of the army in 1857 mm-hmm. was based off of that report she wrote. Wow. So she remains um, in that one hospital for like a year and a half. And then she returned to Lee Hearst for a hero's welcome. Mm. The queen... The queen gives her a brooch that is known as the Nightingale Jewel. Oh, my God. And granted her a prize of, like, 250,000, I guess, pounds at the time. Which in today's money is a kajillion I, dollars. <laughs> even in today's money, that that amount, I'm like, give me that. <laughs> Literally. The queen is like, you're the best. Yeah. Here's a brooch. Wow. Wow. And, it like, she totally deserves it. 100%. But she hated it. When when she came home to the hero's welcome, she's like, don't look at me. Like, I am nothing. Because she hates being the center of yes. attention. Yeah. Wow. She's so, like, humble. Yeah. Couldn't be me. I'd be, like, on the parade float. <laughs> <laughs> I just did a princess wave from my parade float, just so everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, so she gets home, and she's, like, got, gets her brooch, gets her prize, and mm-hmm. she's like, I'm not done. Damn. So she continued to improve the condition of hospitals. She presented her experience and her data to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert in 1856. And with the help of the queen, she was a part of the creation of that commission um, mm-hmm. into the health of the army. The commission hired leading statisticians, William Farr and John Sutherland, who analyzed the army mortality. These men found that of the 18,000 deaths, 16,000 were from Oof. preventable diseases, wow. not the battle. That's so stressful. So the numbers are striking, right? Of course. But Flo took it a step further, and she developed a diagram called the Nightingale Rose Diagram, which displayed how the sanitary commission's work decreased the deaths and made wow, the data yeah. and made that kind of data accessible to other people. So she's accredited with decreasing deaths during wartime from forty two percent to two percent. That's crazy, right? Wow. And then, to top it off, she became the first woman member of the Royal Stat... Stat... Mm -hmm. Statistical... (laughs) Yeah, that's how you say that. I don't know why. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The Royal Statistical Society, which, like, why does that org even exist? But, like, I'm glad it does because she... Royal Statistics, yeah. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) That's so cool. Cool. Damn, she's just killing it in every aspect of her life. She's like, not only will I save your life, I'm also going to put some numbers beside things. I'm going to save everyone's life. I'm going to save the world. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, if I were a soldier at this point in time, who else would you want to take care of you? No one. Nobody. Like, They'd be sending a doctor. I'd be like, no, no. Get him out. Bye-bye. Get him out. <laughs> Where's the lady with the lamp? Give me her. Bring her in. <laughs> she's so cool. She's super cool. In 1855, the Nightingale Fund was established through private donations, and it was like 45,000 pounds Mm -hmm. um, was raised by 1859 and put at her disposal. They're like, you obviously know how to do stuff. Like, here is some more money. And she used that money to establish a um, hospital, St. Thomas Hospital to be exact. Mm -hmm. And in that hospital, she started the Nightingale Training School for Nurses, which was the first nursing school. That's so cool. Yeah, I know. Literally. Yeah. She's an icon and soon got that vibe from everyone. So they had poems, songs, plays were written about her. Women in droves oh. starting enrolling from all social classes yeah. to be nurses because of the good things that she did. Um, and she built all these beautiful things while being ill. So she was actually had developed like mm-hmm. an illness during her time at the Crimean War. And she was like, oh, my God, not well this entire time. But she continued doing the things until she eventually becomes bedridden, as um, I told you earlier. So 
Then in 1860, she wrote the notes on nursing, what it is and what it is not, which found itself into actual households and provided direction on how to oh, manage wow. the sick. Like, so she put like medical information in everyone's hands. Yeah. And that was also the first book that's like accredited to be in nursing education. And she insisted on the importance of prioritizing trusting relationships with patients specifically. Yeah. And she believed that a nurse's presence in like a medical space is vital. Yeah, clearly. And she had empathy with her patients and she thought like making a common experience and interacting and talking about health has been Mm -hmm. the most important thing. So she helped reach like a different caliber in nursing care, obviously, but also in just like the Mm -hmm. accessibility of care in general. That's amazing. So the illness that she had contracted was called the Crimean fever. And by this time she'd done all these things, right? She's 38 years old. And that's when she becomes bedridden for the rest of her life. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's so sad. But she keeps working. So you don't need to worry about her. Of course she does. So she focused on health care reform. She was interviewing politicians from her bed. Mm -hmm. Like, she was in her bed and they would come. If I know one thing about Florence, it's that she kept working. (laughs) Yeah, period. (laughs) She had, like, famous visitors come and see her. In her home, she published additional notes on hospitals. And throughout the Civil War, she was consulted on how to manage uh, field hospitals, like from her bed. Oh, wow. In 1908, she was given the Merit of Honor by King Edward at the age of 88. And then two years later, King George sent a congratulations to her on her 90th birthday. (laughs) Oh, my God. Wow. The entire royal family is, like, involved with her. (laughs) Yeah. They're like, we love you. (laughs) She's a bob. In 1910 is when she got, like, intensely ill and then unexpectedly passed away Saturday, August 13th of 1910. Mm -hmm. She had prepared that her funeral be quiet and modest, and that was against the public wishes. (laughs) Um, The public was like, we want to honor her, and her family denied a national funeral. Like, the entire country wanted to pay homage, and she just, like, didn't want that. So she was um, laid to rest, like, just with her family in a quiet fashion but the whole country is like no we love you yeah so when she started out there was like no such thing as nursing um and i'm reading a quote here the dickens character sarah gamp who was more interested in drinking gin than looking after her patients was only a mild exaggeration like hospitals were places of last resort where the floors were laid with straw to soak up the blood Mm -mm. like and that was what people thought of nursing Florence transformed nursing when she got back from Crimea and she had access to people in high places and she used it to get things done. She was stubborn. She was opinionated and forthright, but she had to be those things in order to achieve all that she did. Oh my God. So they have a museum. I know they have a museum in her honor at the site of their original Nightingale training school Mm -hmm. for nurses. It has over 2000 artifacts in it. Um, wow, and she that's is crazy. acknowledged and revered as the pioneer of modern nursing. You know who should go to that museum? Can we go there? <laughs> us? Tegan should go. Oh, 100%. Tegan should go with us. Oh, Tegan should go. But we should absolutely go. We should have recorded this episode from there. <laughs> oh, I imagine. So... Uh, Two years after her death, the International Committee of the Red Cross created the Florence Nightingale Medal, and that is given to excellent nurses every two years. Mm -hmm. And also there's International Nurses Day that's been celebrated on her birthday since 1965. (laughs) I know. Oh, my God. In May of 2010, the Florence Nightingale Museum at St. Thomas Hospital in London reopened in honor of the 100th anniversary of her death. So there's still... Don't cry. I know you love her. I'm going to cry. Oh, I love her. <laughs> I know. Isn't she so cool? She's so cool. I love her, too. Um, And then to end, I wanted to share, like, the Nightingale Pledge, which is kind of like mm-hmm. the Hippocratic Oath. It's for nurses. Mm-hmm. So it is, and this is like the 19, I think, 70-somethings edition. Okay, so I'm going to read it. Hopefully I don't. Okay. Royally mess it up. I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and to practice my profession faithfully. I will abstain from whatever is de- deterious, deterious, deleterious. What does that mean? 
uh, like bad for you. <laughs> okay. And mischievous. Okay. And will not take or knowing. Well, that was just, I just ruined this entire reading, but I didn't know what that word meant. <laughs> and will not take or knowingly administer any harmful drug. I will do all in my power to maintain and elevate the standard of my profession and will hold in confidence all personal matters committed to my keeping and all family affairs coming to my knowledge in the practice of my calling, which I love that. Yeah. With loyalty, will I endeavor to aid the physician in his work or her? And as a missioner of health, I will dedicate myself to devoted service to human welfare. Wow. This is amazing. This was such a good. You like it? You did such a good job with this, number one. And I cannot believe I didn't know more about her life. Because why would you? She's English. So it's kind of like. Right. England's like. They're like, this is ours. <laughs> She's our friend. <laughs> yeah. My God, yeah. she did so much. And also I'm thinking about it and the forethought as like a very young person to not only be doing all this work, but to be keeping statistics on like who died of what, to be keeping those records and then be like, I know that there's mathematically a way to prove that I'm the best. <laughs> Yeah. Look, let me show. I'm going to add a picture right here so you can see. Oh, she's a little cutie oh. pie. I know. I like her. <laughs> she looks very serious. She's extremely serious. Yeah. She's not playing games. I'll tell you that right now. She said, we is in the business of saving lives. Literally. And that's what I know about that. That was so good. We love Florence Nightingale. Yeah, we do love her. Think about, like, too, how much she changed the world based on, like, revolutionizing the practice of nursing. Because nurses are the ones who are, like, doing the dirty work. They're rolling their sleeves up every day, you know? Yeah. What's really cool is that she was, like, determined for people, for, like, all the people to understand Mm -hmm. health and wellness and, like sanitary practices so it wasn't she didn't limit herself she's like no right she's like i just want to help every person yeah she's amazing i love this episode yay Yay. this was such a good one little flow that was great well thank Thank you all for listening listening. yeah (laughs) (laughs) listening look up flow she's cool Yeah, we hope you guys like this episode. We love occasionally to bring you something a little happy and cheerful. Yeah, exactly. And if you have any recommendations for other people who are like Mm -hmm. um, not as well known, but whose story needs to be told in the healthcare space, send them our way. I think that's this was I think some something that someone had recommended Mm -hmm. in like a previous like just DM, and I had put it on my list. So I'm excited to learn more about her and to kind of keep her in the back of my mind too is like yeah we continue i think it would be it's kind of cool to honor the accomplishments of yeah women at that time too totally and i love a listener recommendation like this is one that needs to be told for sure yeah well i'm glad it wasn't it wasn't a bummer episode which is nice no nice great love it breezy Casual. Yeah, if there are two things that don't describe Flo, it's breezy and casual, but... (laughs) That is so true. She was like, from my deathbed, I will. Her face is so intense. It's like the face of, like, just determination, you know? Yeah. Why are you sitting sitting there looking at me when we could all be doing something? (laughs) Right. She's like, don't take a picture of me. I gotta make some shit happen right now. (laughs) Yeah, literally, literally, that's her. And send in your recommendations. Follow us on social media. Yep. You can send us an email at malpracticepodcast at gmail.com. You can. Uh, don't forget to follow us. And if you like what you're hearing, don't forget to Schmish. subscribe or leave us a review. Yeah. A nice one. And don't forget. Oh, yeah. Malpractice, malpractice makes perfect. Makes perfect. <laughs> Every time. Beep, boop, bop. Bye-bye.